Hello and welcome to a new Warthrunner tutorial. My name is Sheriff and today we take a look at the manual engine controls or in short mech. In the last video I asked which topic you want to see in the next video and well the mech comments were by far in the majority. Uh, it was asked really a lot. So here we go. This tutorial applies to the realistic battles and to the simulator battles. Both game modes are using the same physics, so the mech mode can be used in both and they have the same effect. For the most part this tutorial is for rather experienced pilots which are not busy with keeping their aircraft in the air anymore and for those pilots which are searching to improve the aircraft performance a few percent at the expense of additional workload. I'm pretty sure I could make this video way shorter but for me personally it's easier to learn things when I'm able to understand the technical background. I hope you enjoy. Now you may ask what is mech? Basically it's a manual control of all or some of the engine components which allows you to increase the engine performance or alternatively to fly more economic, for example to save fuel or to keep the engine cooler. At the end of the video I will show you some stats and facts and how much you can improve the performance on one particular example. In the first chapter I want to show you how to set up your controls. In the menu you have to go to the controls and then you have to click on the full real controls. This will unlock the tab engine controls in the top row. Here you can set up your controls for the Mac mode. If you want to use Mac while using mouse aim or mouse joy if you play for example RB or you play uh, with a mouse in SB, you can set up Mac in the full real controls and then you can switch back to the mouse controls afterwards. Even though the Mac tab is disappearing you can use the buttons you have assigned. But back to the topic. If you have the tab engine control selected you see a good bunch of options available. Don't get too stunned here, it's way less complicated as it looks. I will talk about every important system in the next couple of minutes, step by step. But before we are able to control anything of our engine, we have to disable that the game controls the engine. This is done by pressing this button. For presentation's sake I choose the minus key on my num block. As I already mentioned, if you press that button the game stops the support of managing the engine. However, not always are all the systems of a particular plane controlled by the game, but sometimes by the plane itself. So one example, if you press the Mac key while being in a Focke Wolf 190, you will see that basically everything is still controlled by the plane. You can't control anything. The reason for this is that Historically, many German planes had systems installed, like the Kommandogerät, which automatically controlled a lot of systems Allied planes had to control manually. For comparison's sake, if you are in a Spitfire Mark 9, you will see that you can and that you have to control the mixture, the propeller pitch, the supercharger and the radiator yourself. You have no other choice. In the Focke Wolf 190, however, you can switch some of the single systems to manual control if you want. I personally recommend to choose the num block to bind the necessary keys for those systems. Of course, you can bind the Mac to the keys you want, but for this video, I just assume we all choose the num block. I use the num block myself when I test planes in the test flight because I use the RB test flight and therefore the mouse. However, for SB I have bound the Mac to my joystick in a more complicated manner. Not necessary to explain here in detail, as it is only a thing of personal taste, um, I think. When you understood the basics behind Mac, you will come up with some ideas for yourself and how to bind the necessary keys. If you are interested, my controls for RB and SB are in the description. But back to the num block. I recommend to bind the main components on each row of the num block. For example, the row 1, 4, 7 for the radiator, the row 2, 5, 8 for the propeller pitch and the row 3, 6, 9 for the mixture. I explain every system and what to do with those three keys in a moment. We will start with the radiators. If you take a close look, you will see on most planes some kind of little flaps. 
No, not the big ones on the wings, but the little flaps, for example around the engine or below the wings, at those little stubs below the wings of the 109 or Spitfires. These flaps are covering the radiators of those planes. Coolant or oil is flowing through these uh, radiators and the incoming airflow takes excessive heat from these liquids. Now you may ask, why do we need those flaps covering the radiators when you want that the air gets to the radiator and that the heat gets away from the engine? Well, the air which is pushing against the radiators is creating a tremendous amount of drag and slows the aircraft down. So if you don't need to cool the engine, you can close the radiator flaps to cover the radiator and therefore to reduce the drag. In War Thunder, when flying a plane like the Focke-Wulf 190 or the 109s, you have to disable the automatic radiator control of the plane itself, even after switching to Mac with a minus key. This I have bound to the one of the num block. For example, you press the minus key to disable the automatic engine mode and then you press one to disable the automatic radiators. After that you can open the radiators by pressing the 7 and to close them by pressing the 4. In the bottom of the screen you can see the little value in percent. At a percentage of 100 the radiators are fully open and at 0% fully closed. With the most planes it is sufficient to open the radiators to 30 or 40% at a normal 100% throttle cruise. At takeoff and while climbing I open the radiator to at least 70% to be able to stay on maximum power for a prolonged time. Only with fully closed radiators the aircraft is able to get the maximum speed. Maybe one word on the oil radiators. With a recent patch separate oil radiators were introduced for several planes like the TA-152C for example or the P-47M. I have bound the oil radiators to the 4 and the 7 as well like the normal radiators but additionally I have to keep the 0 pressed when I want to open or to close the radiators of the oil. I tested a bit but I don't saw any impact on the speed of the aircraft um, when I opened or closed the oil radiators. So I keep the oil radiators opened at 100% all the time. But keep in mind the oil radiators as I said were um, introduced in the last patch so it is likely that some mechanics are about to change in the next patches so maybe the speed will be affected after all but not at the moment. If you want to know how to set up the different axes, take a look at the screenshots in the description. I think this will answer a lot of questions for you. Surely one of the most complicated things when it comes to mech is the control of the propeller pitch, as you can easily damage your aircraft when you don't know what you are doing. First we have two different types of aircraft propellers in War Thunder, variable pitch propellers and constant speed propellers. Some technical background here. In reality, to make an aircraft good at accelerating, we need a propeller which moves very fast through the air and shovels a lot of air through the back to create maximum thrust. This is accomplished by a propeller blade which is at a very fine angle to the incoming air. However, as the aircraft accelerates, the incoming air is pushing harder and harder against the propeller blades. The maximum speed of the aircraft is much lowered by this. Even worse, when the aircraft gets faster, for example in a dive, the air is pushing with such a force against the blades that the propeller starts to speed up and with it the RPM of the engine, like a windmill. Under these circumstances the engine RPM can get faster than the engine can mechanically handle and the engine gets damaged. Realizing this, the engineers made it possible that the pilot could change the propeller pitch in mid-flight. In this way the pilot could use a fine pitch while taking off and climbing while having a great acceleration. In level flight and diving the pilot can switch to a more coarse pitch and the aircraft is able to fly faster without damaging the engine. Basically the pilot is moving the propeller blades out of the airstream and is therefore reducing the drag. It's very important to keep an eye on the engine RPM when flying a variable pitch propeller. If the pilot keeps flying at a too fine pitch at high speeds, the engine still gets damaged. 
Seeing that the necessity to check the RPMs all the time, especially in stressful situations like air combat clearly is, is an enormous workload for the pilot, the engineers searched for a solution again. They built a device which changed the propeller pitch in dependence of speed and RPM automatically. This way the pilot only had to set a certain engine RPM and the aircraft did the rest basically. This is called a constant speed propeller, as the device tries to hold that engine RPM precisely. The workload for the pilot was immensely reduced and at the same time the aircraft has maximum performance while accelerating and in level flight. Both systems, the variable pitch propeller and the constant speed propeller are in the game of War Thunder. Let's talk about the variable pitch propeller first. You will meet the variable pitch propeller mostly in planes up to tier 2 in War Thunder on rather old planes like the Emi series for the bf 109s for example, or the first Spitfires. But there are exceptions, for example if you deactivate your automatic propeller pitch in the Focke-Wolves you will get a variable pitch propeller as well. If you want to fly an aircraft with such a propeller I recommend to test that plane extensively in the test flight before you do the real thing. Take a look at the RPMs of the engine, take a look how high the RPMs uh, can get before the engine gets damaged. In my controls I deactivate the automatic propeller pitch with a 2 and I raise the propeller pitch with a 8 and I lower it with a 5. The moment you deactivate the automatic controls uh, the pitch will go to 50%. At a higher percentage it's a fine pitch for takeoff and climbing and a lower percentage it's a coarse pitch for high speed. You can use the propeller pitch of 0% if your engine is damaged or your fuel had run out for example. This will reduce the propeller drag and will increase your gliding capabilities. This is called feathering. I once glided back from the enemy airfield at 4000 meters to my base with a feathered propeller. It can be really really useful. How high you should set your propeller pitch in certain situations like takeoff, climb or level flight is highly dependent of the aircraft you fly. As I said, test it a lot. I personally recommend to keep planes in the automatic propeller pitch control if possible because managing the propeller pitch is a lot of work and you can't hear your engine so good as, for example, in Cliffs of Dover. In Cliffs you can tell only by the sound of the engine if the engine is close to an overref and you can correct the propeller pitch then. In War Thunder, however, the sound of the engine is not so fine-tuned, it's actually very hard. For me personally, if I have a plane with a variable pitch propeller, I always fly in the automatic mode, so I don't control my engine whatsoever because it's kinda hard in War Thunder, I have to say. Luckily for us, most planes in War Thunder are equipped with a constant speed propeller and the risk to damage is here very low. Here you don't set the pitch of the propeller with the propeller pitch controls, which sounds very weird I know, but you control the RPM of the engine, the revolutions per minute, and you don't have to think about over revving your engine all the time. But let's take the Spitfire Mark 9 as an example again. It has a constant speed propeller. At takeoff I ramp up the RPM to 100% to the maximum power available. Theoretically I can just keep the propeller pitch at 100% all day long without worrying too much. However this will cause a lot of heat because the engine is running all the time at full power. So I use 100% at takeoff and while climbing and dogfighting but if I cruise around I reduce the RPM to 80 to 90%. This leads to a way cooler engine and gives me more time at full power when necessary. Additionally, this doesn't have a great impact on the maximum speed of our aircraft, as the numbers at the end of the video will confirm. If you want to know more about that topic, I recommend to take a look at the description. There are two links. The first one is to a nice piece of text which describes the propeller pitch in detail and the second link is a video which explains the difference between variable pitch propellers and constant speed propellers in detail. Especially the video is highly highly recommended. I am pretty sure most of you know that you need a certain amount of oxygen to burn a certain amount of fuel. Problem is that oxygen, or air in general, gets pretty rare if you fly higher up in your aircraft. With less oxygen you can't burn as much fuel and the performance of the engine drops. 
If you don't change the amount of fuel which gets to the engine, there will be a lot of unburned fuel in the engine. So the pilot has to reduce the amount of fuel, because if he doesn't, the engine gets flooded with fuel and stops working. If then we fly lower again, the pilot has to increase the amount of fuel again to get the desired performance. Of course, you can fly with a lower fuel mixture on lower altitude if you want. This is called a lean mixture. A lean mixture saves fuel but lets the engine heat up. A rich mixture with a high percentage of fuel increases the performance, increases the fuel consumption and lets the engine cool down a bit. But before I talk too much about mixture and the topic in general, this isn't implemented with all planes in War Thunder. I would even say it's pretty rare that you have to play around with a mixture at all. There are some Russian planes with modeled mixture and I think that the P-47 has mixture modeled. For this video I tested it with our beloved Spitfire and there was absolutely no difference at all between 40% mixture and 100% mixture across all altitudes. So here it is necessary again to test your aircraft if it has a, a mixture control enabled. Go out and test flight, fly around with some different mixtures and take a look at the engine performance to get a feeling for it. But mostly it won't be necessary to control it at all. Should your engine staff try to raise or to lower the mixture in dependence of your current altitude and if the engine doesn't start uh, again by itself, try a complete restart. In my controls I raise the mixture with a 9 and I lower it with a 6. Here you don't need a key for disabling the automatic control of the mixture as every plane where you have access to the mixture control, you have to control the mixture. Most American planes have mixture control for example. Rarely modeled as I said, but the community manager told me that Gaijin is planning to implement it on every plane. We will see. Well, we talked a minute ago about losing power on higher altitudes because the air gets thinner. And of course the engineers were thinking again how they could improve the high alt performance. And they came up with a compressor, which, who wonders, compresses the air and delivers it to the engine. This way the performance of the plane on sea level will be available on higher altitudes. This device is known as supercharger as well. However, even the compressed air is at a certain altitude not enough to hold the performance level of the aircraft. The solution to this was quite simple. The engineers built another compressor right after the first one. The compressed air gets cooled and compressed again. This is called a second supercharger stage. In those stages the pilot has to control. When the pilot takes off, the supercharger runs in stage 1 and at a certain altitude the pilot has to switch to stage 2, as the performance of the first stage is now not sufficient enough. In War Thunder this is pretty easy to control with one single key. I recommend the plus key on the num block for example. But now for the hard part. The altitude on which we have to switch the supercharger stage is dependent of the plane and the power settings we are at at the moment. I think at this point it is wise to use an example again and again we are talking about uh, our beloved Spitfire Mark 9 LF. To test the performance of the first and the second supercharger stage I climbed to 5000 meters. And I hope you can see that on web the second stage starts to produce more power above 1700 meters. So if you are climbing with full power switch your supercharger stage at 1700 meters to stage 2. If you drop below that switch back to stage 1. At 100% throttle however this is a bit different. There the first stage is more powerful up to an altitude of 4300 meters. So if you want to cruise around at lower altitudes it makes sense to stay in stage 1. However if you are above 1700 meters and you meet an enemy remember to switch your gear so you have the maximum performance. Keep in mind as well that every plane is different in War Thunder and that you have to look up the correct altitudes for your supercharger. For this I recommend the browser map uh, you can open in the options. 
this is especially useful if you have a second screen so you can st switch between stage one stage two and you can look up if the horsepowers are going up or dropping at this point we have to talk about the turbocharger a bit it works technically a bit different however we really don't need to think about the turbocharger as every plane which has one can control it fully automatically the P47 or the P38s, for example, are planned with the turbocharger and they control it automatically. I mean, we can set up keys for the turbocharger in the menu. However, every time I try to control the turbocharger, something of the engine got damaged. And I really don't see any possible gain from controlling the turbocharger. I mean, it keeps up the performance on the high altitudes and going below that makes no sense for me at all. Maybe if you have some ideas, share them in the comments. But uh, if you have a plane with a turbocharger, just keep the turbocharger in automatic mode. There is, for my, in my opinion, no need to change something. Maybe now you think that's a lot to do. And yes, you are right, at least in some parts. The workload when you use Mac increases. This is certain. On some planes a bit and some planes a lot. And I'm sure for that increase in workload you want to see some improvement and uh, that's what I'm going to show you now. As always we will take a look at the Spitfire again. The Spit is able to reach in the automatic control a speed of 550 kph. If we now switch to Mac and we close the radiators fully while still on full WAP and 100% RPM we are able to reach 570 kph, which is, yes, 20 kph faster. That, that doesn't sound that much, right? Well, in that speed region, there are a lot of 109s, and those 20 kph can be the difference between running and getting catched. However, with fully closed radiators, you will cook your engine in a pretty fast way. But I'd rather have cooked my engine, but I could reach my airfield instead of being a wreckage on the ground. But with Mac, we have even more options than only to cook the engine and have the maximum speed. If you reduce the RPM with the propeller pitch controls to 80% and open the radiator flaps to 40%, we can fly as fast as with the automatic controls, but with the difference that your engine stays much cooler. As you can see, the temperatures are stable and in a region where the engine doesn't get damaged. We have now a much higher endurance in comparison to the automatic controlled spit. What got me interested while testing the spit for this video was a comparison of the climb performance as I never saw any stats on that. I mean, if I open the radiator it should slow me down a bit, but my engine should be cooler as with the uh, automatic controls. So I went testing it and the results were pretty astonishing I have to say. First I climbed to 4000 meters with the automatic controls and then with Mac. Both on full power, but the manual engine controls with 70% opened radiators. Now, what do you think? How much slower I was with opened radiators? The answer is 2 seconds. 2 damn seconds. And now, take a look at the temperatures. While my engine of the automatic control is almost cooking, the manually controlled engine is in perfect state. And here again we have a big advantage in endurance. If it would be necessary now to dogfight at this point here, it would be no problem with the manually controlled engine. But with the automatic control spit, I wouldn't be able to sustain full power very long here. So my conclusion is, you have big gains with Mac if you know what you are doing, but you increase your workload a lot. So I can recommend to use Mac when you are already experienced and if you have no trouble to control your plane and if you can uh, keep that plane in the air. And especially if you are searching for the next step to improve your gameplay. However, if you are still struggling to counter engine torque and to keep crashing while dogfighting, don't think about Mac, it only makes things worse. Focus on flying first. If you want to get into Mac, I recommend to take the first steps in German planes like the BF109Gs or the Focke-Wulf 190Ds as they allow to select which systems you want to control manually. 
After understanding what to do with those aircrafts, you can do the next step with British or American planes. But that's it for today. It was pretty long, I hope you liked it, share it with your friends, as I have the right to get smart as well. I hope we see us in the next one. If you want to see more, subscribe. See you then. Bye bye.